Welcome to the National Press Club, the place where news happens. I'm Emily Wilkins, membership secretary of the Press Club and Bloomberg government congressional and campaigns reporter. Thank you all for joining us today for our virtual headliners newsmaker with Dan Moraine, author of Kamala's Way. We are happy to accept questions from our audience today and I'll try and ask as many questions as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners, headliners at press.org. Just five days ago, the United States inaugurated Kamala Harris as Vice President of the United States, the first woman, the first Black and Indian American woman to break through a glass ceiling that seemed unusually hard to crack. How did she do it? What are the qualities that made Vice President Harris, a daughter of immigrants without political pedigree, uniquely suited for this historic accomplishment? If anyone has an inkling about what makes Kamala tick, it's Dan Moraine. Mr. Moraine, a former longtime reporter for the Los Angeles Times and the editorial editor for the Sacramento Bee, has watched and reported on Harris for decades, keeping his eye on the achievements that lifted her to the national stage, the controversies that nearly felled her, and the relationships that have sustained her. Mr. Moraine brings Harris's journey to life with vivid antidotes and in-depth interviews with colleagues and friends. The book also offers perspectives on the external factors that came together to bring the nation to this moment. As he wrote last summer in an opinion piece for the Washington Post, smart Republicans could see that Kamala D. Harris coming years ago and they tried to smother her early. Now, Mr. Moran wrote, America is about to see what those Republicans could see long ago. Harris is a quick learner, a gifted political performer with genuine star power. We are delighted to have Dan here to discuss Kamala's way and American life. Dan, thank you so much for joining us. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you so much. You know, Dan, you have such um, a long and storied career covering California politics, and California has so many interesting politicians. I'm wondering if you could talk about why specifically you decided to do a book on Kamala Harris. What about her made you think, yes, I can absolutely write hundreds and hundreds of pages and, and spend years researching this person? Well, it wasn't years. <laughs> it was it was months. Uh, but... Um, uh, it, <laughs> You're, you're right, California has, um, it, it's such an interesting state politically. Um, it, it, we, um, out here we've produced folks like Jerry Brown and Ronald Reagan, Richard Nixon. So it's, it's, it's such a varied state. Um, and and it, it, it is especially interesting in San Francisco, the Bay Area, which is where Kamala Harris comes from. Um, you know, you think about it, um, Nancy Pelosi is from San Francisco. She sits in the seat that was once held by Phil Burton, who was an incredible powerhouse in, in uh, Congress uh, until his uh, uh, early death. Um, it produced uh, Willie Brown, who was a, a legendary uh, politician out here and, and um, has a national footprint. Um, Diane Feinstein, Barbara Boxer, they all come from San Francisco. They all have San Francisco roots. So, uh, so that was one of the, the, the key ingredients in Kamala Harris's rise. Got it. And when you did, I, I'm struck, I was reading the book and the first time that you mentioned that you covered a story on Harris was I think November of 1994. So you've covered her for 26 years. I'm wondering when you were working on this book, was there anything that you discovered through your reporting that surprised you about her that you didn't know previously? Well, there certainly were details. When, um, uh, when I was um, a political affairs columnist for the Sacramento Bee and, um, and then editorial page editor, um, the, the perception of Kamala Harris was that she was cautious, overly cautious, uh, didn't take stands on, on key issues. And, it, and, you know, I'm not sure that I would change too many words in some of those columns that I wrote in 2011 and 12, uh, but I'm not sure that cautious is the right word. I, I think that she was, she was careful. She picked her fights carefully. She was um, quite strategic. Uh, I think she thought multiple steps ahead. Um, these are the sorts of qualities that that really um, I think set her apart from um, from many politicians and 
and uh, uh, helped her rise. Um, so yeah, I find her um, uh, really a fascinating uh, character in, in ways that, I mean, you could see the first, you know, the first time I saw Kamala Harris and, and met her really uh, in 2007 when she was working on uh, trying to elect Barack Obama uh, president, trying to help him with the nomination. Um, you could tell that this is a star, right? I mean, she's very charismatic. She lights up her room when she comes in. She's uh, a, a very good speaker and a good retail politician. All those attributes um, led her to this point, I think. And, I, and I, I know you mentioned her being cautious. I know this is something that comes up in the book a lot. Is there any particular antidote that you think really sort of defines how Harris is cautious? Because I do feel like that's a trait that you, maybe this is me talking as a reporter, but one that you do see a lot in politicians. You know, they're very careful with what most of them are very careful with what they say. Are there any particular antidote that really defines for you sort of how Harris balances that, that cautiousness with that charisma? Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> You know, she she is um, a, an opponent of the death penalty. Uh, it, it was um, uh, uh, she when she first ran for public office, San Francisco district attorney. She made clear that she would never bring a death penalty case, um, and she didn't. She stuck to that. She stuck to that uh, promise. Um, when she became California attorney general, and the attorney general's job is to um, uh, one among its jobs, one of, one of its main jobs is, is to uh, defend death penalty verdicts uh, in, before the California Supreme Court and federal courts uh, on appeal. Um, she promised then that she would, uh, although oppose the death penalty, although she continued to oppose the death penalty, that she would enforce the law. Understandable, past attorneys general uh, opposed the death penalty and and um, uh, and found ways to support the, the law as it existed. Um, nonetheless, when she was attorney general, there were there were three instances where she really could have been out front. Uh, two ballot measures, two initiatives sought to uh, abolish the death penalty. Uh, one sought to speed it up. Of course, that didn't happen. The one to speed it up passed. Uh, the two that, that sought to abolish it failed, not by wide margins, but presumably if, if Harris had taken an out front position on, on, any, uh, on those two that, that would have abolished the penalty, who knows, maybe, it, maybe they would have passed. Um, uh, she chose not to. The, her reasoning, um, you know, I certainly understood her reasoning. Her reasoning was that that she um, that her deputies have to defend the law in the courts, and had she taken a position that might have undermined their um, uh, ability to do that, other attorneys general had taken stands on on important issues of the day, and uh, and also found a way to um, maintain their um, their positions in courts. Uh, Another uh, instance was um, uh, back in 1994, California passed uh, uh, an extraordinarily harsh version of the three strikes sentencing law. So under this law in California, you could, um, if it was your third strike, be sent to prison for 25 years to life for shoplifting, for stealing a pizza that in fact was a pizza thief who was, who was sent off to prison more than one. Um, for really long periods of time. Um, politics changed in California, the attitudes of voters changed. Um, and in 2012, there was a ballot measure uh, to uh, sand back the hard edges of that uh, 1994 initiative. Um, she could have taken a stand on that, she chose not to. Um, so that was uh, uh, another instance where she was being cautious. She was being careful. Um, I understand, again, the reason, although it's a little bit harder to understand the reason in the three strikes measure, but uh, nonetheless, that, that was the stand she took. And it, it's really interesting to hear you sort of describe that, uh, that caution too, because you think I think a lot of people now are beginning to see Harris as a leader, as a, I mean, obviously she was a presidential contender. She's now vice president. And I'm wondering, you know, that, that cautiousness, it sort of contrasts a little bit with what we think of when we think of a leader. When did it sort of first dawn on you that Harris would 
sort of have a place on the national stage, that she would sort of be able to rise to prominence in the way that she has? Well, um, it was apparent in 2010 when she was running for California Attorney General that that she was a person, um, uh, being California Attorney General was not gonna be her final stop, at least um, uh, not if she um, had any control over it. Um, she was going to run beyond that, but it doesn't really matter what I think. Um, it was um, uh, in her her opponent in the 2010 um, race for attorney general was um, uh, Steve Cooley. He was the LA County District Attorney. He had been there three terms. He had far more experience than she did. Um, he was coming from the population base in California. Two thirds of the people live in Southern California, so. Uh, most people thought he was going to win. Um, uh, uh, former Attorney General uh, Democrat Bill Lockyer uh, thought he was going to win. Um, we at the Sacramento Bee wrote an editorial endorsing Cooley, not Harris. I wrote that editorial, at least took the lead in writing it. Um, uh, not because we thought he was going to win necessarily. We thought he'd be better. Um, anyway, uh, the the... Republicans nationally weighed in on this race in California, the race for California Attorney General. I've been aware of attorney, attorneys general going back to the middle 1980s. I've, I've written about them, just given the, the, the beats that I've had over the years. Um, I had never seen a, a race for California Attorney General become nationalized in that way, but there was a million dollars, more than a million dollars spent by a super PAC uh, to knock her off uh, uh, early on, um, and uh, and then Barack Obama, President uh, Barack Obama, came into California and did a fundraiser for her uh, uh, in uh, Atherton, wealthy suburb of San Francisco and Silicon Valley, and and did a rally down in L.A. and and uh, so the race became nationalized. Um, and you remember 2010 was a pretty rough year for Democrats um, uh, in, in nationally. And it was a rough year for President Obama, the you know, Congress flip. That was the year of the Tea Party. Um, but he carved out time to come out here for, Cal for Kamala Harris. So it became a nationalized race. Clearly, people were thinking in 2010 that, uh, that she was, uh, she was um, ascendant. Uh, that if she won, then she'd be, you know, she'd be in play. Again, as we all know, Attorney General, the initials are AG, which means aspiring governor. So the assumption was that she was going to be governor, run for governor. Um, then Barbara Boxer retired and she ran for U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I actually, I, what you touched on it in there, I was going to bring it up a little bit later, but I'll just ask you now, you mentioned that you wrote the um, editorial that endorsed her challenger. I know you also wrote, I think going back to that November, 1994, I believe the first story you wrote was that she was appointed to a role by the California State Assembly Speaker, Willie Brown, who she at the time was romantically involved with. And you wrote a story on that. So you've definitely had some, some criticisms for Harris um, over the years. And I'm wondering how has she responded to those, how does she sort of respond to to criticism, to to harsh rhetoric? To not saying that your rhetoric was harsh, but certainly something that she'll experience as vice president. Well, um, well, as a news reporter in 1994, I didn't take a position. Um, in uh, as a uh, and um, in the two set the 2008 presidential campaign when I. Uh, got to know her a little bit. I didn't take a position. Certainly, as a as a political affairs columnist, I did, and and I, I could be pretty tough and certainly snarky on occasion. Um, so so here's here's my experience. My experience is that um, I, you know I think she read what I wrote, um, and she didn't take it personally. Um, yeah, I remember um, one instance where. Um, where she just made an offhand reference at, at, at something, some piece that I had written. I can't remember at this point what it was, but then she moved on and she talked about uh, uh, she talked about what she wanted to talk about, and 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 it was a conversation. So, so my perception is that um, that she is not thin-skinned when it comes to 
uh, criticism uh, by the press. Now, who knows, maybe the National Press Corps will find that to be different, um, uh, but uh, it, it was not my experience. Got it. Got it. So she's definitely got the, the thick skin probably needed for, for the national stage and, and the national role. Um, can you talk a little bit about how she did become a contender for the vice presidential nomination? I know her name was in the mix, I think, pretty early on, but so were a lot of individuals. How did she sort of become the one that Biden wound up cho choosing? Well, you know, I think the National Press Corps probably has a better fix on that than than I do from out here in California. But but what I do know, um, well, I, you know, I mean, President Biden said early on he was going to pick a woman, and and then George Floyd died, was killed uh, under the knee of a police officer. I think that changed politics nationally. Um, uh, so it became apparent that he was going to pick a person of color. Um, Susan Rice was obviously in the mix. Uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass was clearly in the mix. Um, uh, you know, we know Karen Bass out here. She was Assembly Speaker. Um, she's, uh, uh, you know, a, a very good politician and, and no doubt would have been um, fine on the ticket. Um, there was a perception that Kamala Harris was uh, overly ambitious. I think that that's such an odd attribute to give to a politician. I think all politicians, anyone who's, who rises is ambitious. Um, uh, that uh, at, at any rate, what, whatever was happening in Wilmington, um, what was happening out here was that um, a group of her uh, friends and allies led by um, California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Konolakis, um, who, who was, um, as an aside, ambassador to Hungary under uh, President Obama, um, organized a phone call uh, with um, influential Democrats. So Gray Davis, former governor, recalled in 2003, was on that call. Uh, uh, the mayor of Long Beach, Mayor Garcia, was on that call. The then mayor of Stockton, Michael Tubbs, was on that call. A bunch of Democrats who were um, significant uh, people. Uh, and the point of this call was to give each one of them yeah, 90 seconds to sort of say, uh, to talk about Kamala Harris's, the depth of her support um, in California. And, um, and I, the perception I have, certainly the perception we have out here in California, I think, is, is that that call was, was, was important to the extent that people thought that, that uh, Kamala Harris was losing her support in California, that, uh, that the point of the call was to make clear that now really she, she did have a well of support out here. Um, and uh, so I, I believe that that had an impact. Um, you know, the Washington Press Corps may, uh, may uh, discover um, more about that. Mm -hmm. And I know, well, I know the one thing that the Washington Press Corps, I think, dug onto a little bit was also her relationship that she established as California Attorney General with um, Bo Biden and just the, the relationship that they had as they worked on uh, numerous projects together and, and that connection there. Right. Well, that, um, you know, it, 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 there is no doubt, but that, but that um, uh, Joe Biden um, no, I, you know, I don't know Joe Biden. I met him once in 2007. I'm sure he doesn't remember me. There'd be no reason why he would out in Des Moines. Um, uh, but in um, 2016, um, it was less than a year after uh, Attorney General Bo Biden had died, uh, Joe Biden came out to California. Uh, Kamala Harris was running for the U.S. Senate. Uh, and uh, uh, against a Democrat, uh, uh, Loretta Sanchez, Congresswoman from Southern Cup from Orange County. Um, and he gave a, a, a speech that I saw. It was before the Democratic uh, uh, State Committee, uh, State Convention. Um, it was a terrific speech. It was, went on long. It was, it was very Biden-esque. Um, but he opened it by talking about uh, how close Bo Biden had been with, uh, with Kamala Harris and, and how that really mattered to him. Um, he was out there to make clear that, that Joe Biden, that he 
uh, was endorsing Kamala Harris's run for the US Senate. Um, uh, and that certainly helped. She ended up getting the Democratic Party endorsement over fellow Democrat Congresswoman Sanchez, Loretta. And um, uh, so it, it's clear. And then when he uh, announced his selection of Kamala Harris, he made clear that, that, that what Bo, had, Bo Biden had told him mattered. Their alliance dates back to their first year or her first year as, as, as attorney general when she was um, uh, trying to get uh, additional uh, money for California uh, in, in the national litigation over the housing crash. Um, and Bo Biden was, was an ally. They, they, they uh, were a bit of a team there. And, and so I think that that's where, that it was an important relationship um, and, uh, and it, um, you know, had dividends. And I know that was good for her because she'd kind of struck out on her own. There was a deal on the table and she walked away. She said, you know, as you were reporting your book, you know, that this wasn't, it wasn't, she didn't feel it was enough. And though to find that ally then in Bo Biden and be able to work with him on it, um, you know, it definitely, it sounds like, you know, he was definitely there at a moment where she was trying to, to break away from the pack and, and do something that, um, you know, not everyone wanted her to, to do. Right. Well, they were there for each other in that instance. You know, California was especially hard hit in the, um, in the crash of 2007 and 8. Um, uh, you know, particularly parts of the Central Valley have, have to this day not fully recovered. Um, and now, of course, we're dealing with the um, pandemic. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, the houses were foreclosed on and and ultimately, many of them were bought up by um, uh, Wall Street firms and our, our rentals. So, so we've never really attained the home ownership level that we had prior to the crash. Um, and it made it so important that 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 the Attorney General at the time, Harris, um, you know, she went to bat for uh, for the state, for parts of the state that that actually, you know, didn't really vote for her, Central Valley especially. Um, uh, to, to get a little bit more. So, and, and it, sure. I mean, it was going to be two or 3 million and it ended up being about 20 or billion, two or 3 billion and ended up being about 20 billion. So she got more. Got yeah. Just big, big difference. Um, I think you, I'm trying to remember if you, if you mentioned this, uh, while we've been chatting here, if it was right before we had everyone join us, um, but Harris didn't actually speak with, to you for this book. Um, and I wanted to sort of see if you could just think a minute on, I mean, not just, you know, why maybe she didn't chat with you, but also what, if any holes are, are missing because she and the Biden campaign, um, you know, didn't, didn't grant an interview. Like, what are some things that you feel like she needs to, what were questions that you were going to ask her if you had the chance? Yeah, well, she, the, they didn't, her family did not help. Um, the, the, um, you know, really it was, uh, it was, uh, uh, a very intense two month um, reporting and writing period, September and October. And she was pretty busy during that time. So I, you know, I understood it um, as soon as, um, uh, as, as soon as um, it became apparent that I was um, gonna be writing this book, I uh, sent an email to the Biden campaign, to her person who was, uh, to her person in the Biden campaign asking for an interview and I sent subsequent emails when I had questions and, and, um, and I, you know, got nothing and nothing back. I mean, I got, you know, sort of polite no's um, and the same from uh, Kamala Harris's family. So, um, uh, the, you know, she was disciplined. She, she is a very disciplined politician. So I, I think the National Press Corps will see that she's very good at not answering a question if she chooses not to answer a question. Um, uh, and she, you know, she can, it's not as if she's being rude. She's just, she just is disciplined uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there are, there are things that I want to know. Um, absolutely. If I had had the opportunity to, to interview her for um, even an hour, um, she was a, a a deputy district attorney in Alameda County, Oakland, uh, in uh, uh, 1990, her first year uh, as, as a lawyer. Um, it, you know, as, it, when she went to Howard University uh, uh, in your town, um, she marched against apartheid. Um, 
she writes about that in her in her autobiography, The Truths We Hold. Um, in 1990, uh, Nelson Mandela came out to California, to Oakland, to the Oakland Coliseum to speak. And I was there, I covered it for the LA Times. Um, uh, I wanted to know if she was there. It's just a basic, a basic fact. Uh, uh, and, and if she was there, what she came away with, I know what I came away with. It was, it was such a hugely moving event. Uh, the Coliseum was full that day, it was huge. It was, a, um, you, know, you know, the BART train going into the Coliseum was full and, and people were, were, you know, it was a very exciting day. Um, uh, it's a good story too, um, from my perspective, um, because California had had an important role in, in, in the abolition of apartheid. California under Willie Brown and, and Maxine Waters, Congresswoman then in the assembly, uh, pushed legislation to uh, force the California uh, public employee pension plans to divest their holdings in South Africa. That was important. Nelson Mandela talked about that. The importance of that. Anyway, so I wanted to know what she thought about that. I don't know. Uh, and then in 1991, of course, that was uh, the Clarence Thomas uh, uh, confirmation hearing. She had to have been paying attention to that. She was a deputy district attorney, had to have, have been paying attention to that. And I wondered what she thought of uh, Anita Hill and the whole spectacle. And of course, her, uh, you know, uh, then Senator Biden had such a pivotal role. So I don't know about that. Um, somebody will ask her that, I'm sure, I hope. Especially because uh, what, you know, what happened with Anita Hill and then the parallel with her own question of Brett Kavanaugh when Dr. Christine Blasey Ford was was in front of the panel. I know that that was something that, um, you know, it was, it, I, I guess I'll use the term moment. It was her questioning was really highlighted as part of that larger hearing. Absolutely. And so, of course, that, that would, I would have drawn that connection and and uh, that, um, you know, so anyway, so that's a whole, I don't understand uh, her relationship with her father. Um, uh, you know, she, she has said he's a nice guy, uh, but they're not close. Um, uh, uh, interesting to me, don't know why. Uh, and then there are some policy issues I'd certainly uh, wanna ask her about. Got it. Can I ask, because I'm a wonk and I love this stuff, any particular policies that you think the national media should should ask her about when, when they have the chance? Um, well, some of the decisions that she made or didn't make as, as California Attorney General, um, it's, more, it's more historical stuff than, than, than current stuff. When she was um, running for U.S. Senate, though, um, uh, Interesting at the at the time, uh, uh, Javier Becerra was contemplating running against her, um, and and was seriously considering it. Um, uh, he succeeded her, as you know, as California Attorney General, and now is the nominee to be Health and Human Services Secretary under President Biden. Um, you know, he raised some interesting issues. What you know, I, I. I I think though that they probably since have been resolved. I mean, I'm sure she's supportive of NATO and the European Union and, and uh, very clearly uh, supportive of, of uh, you know, her mother was a, a breast cancer researcher. She's a child of a scientist. Uh, she's clearly not a science denier. She uh, uh, clearly, uh, uh, is supportive of re-entering the, the Paris Accords as, as President Biden has done. You know, I'd want to ask her some, uh, more details about, about that sort of thing. For sure. When it comes to her being Biden's vice president, I'm wondering if you sort of have a sense of what type of vice president she's going to be particularly in relation to Biden. Is she going to be a check on certain policies of him? Is she going to contrast him in certain ways? Or do you see the two of them being very in step for the next four years? Well, I don't think there's any doubt but that she would run for president if, if the opportunity presents itself. Um, but her success as, as a presidential candidate really depends on Joe Biden's success. And so her, uh, her ability to um, ascend to that next stop, that final step is, um, 
uh, is really dependent on Joe Biden's success. So I think her ability to be the best vice president she can possibly be uh, is is her is her um, uh, path to to a, a serious presidential campaign. Now, who knows what's going to happen? Um, I know the conventional wisdom uh, in your town is is that he's a one term president. I, I don't know that. Um, you know, I think. President Biden has wanted to be president for a long time. Um, uh, if his health permits, I think he, I, I don't know why he wouldn't run for a second term. Um, uh, at any rate, if it's 2024 or 2028 or 2032, she's young enough she could run in any of those years uh, uh, or even beyond. Um, it all depends on, on her ability to, to help him be the best vice, best president he can be. I'd be really surprised, really surprised if there is any daylight between, um, between um, her and Joe Biden publicly. She, um, she will be uh, forceful privately. She will express her opinions privately. I just don't see her as being a, um, uh, as, as um, separating herself from him uh, in any kind of public way. You know, he would not, he, you don't choose somebody such as Kamala Harris, not that there's anybody quite like her, um, to be your vice president, to shove her off in a corner like some potted plant. I mean, this is a serious woman who's got opinions and, and thoughts and, and, and she's forceful. She's um, somebody to contend with. So uh, he picked her because he wants, he wants somebody who's strong and she is. Got it. We also have a couple of questions that are coming in from our viewers. Just a reminder, if anyone would like to submit a question to Dan, the place to do that is to email headliners at press.org. We've got one question in uh, that I think is really interesting. Um, can you talk a little bit about the relationship between her and Barack Obama, whether his experiences as the first Black president are informing her approach for being the first Black vice president? Does he, does he guide her? Does he give her any advice? What sort of relationship do, do the two of them have? Well, I was part of the LA Times team um, that helped cover the 2008 presidential campaign. And I spent a lot of time in Chicago um, rummaging around uh, Barack Obama's affairs and uh, his, his business dealings and his, his life in Chicago. Um, so I felt like at the time I had a pretty good fix on his uh, politics and and his policy views as a state senator and U.S. senator and sort of a Chicago politician. I never have interviewed him, so I have no idea what he truly thinks about uh, Kamala Harris. Um, I do know that that they uh, that they helped one another. I mean, she um, helped organize a fundraiser for state senator Barack Obama. She uh, she was there when he was a, uh, a an early U.S. senator. Um, uh, you know, as, as your viewers, members know, uh, California is a place where politicians come, it's an ATM. And certainly San Francisco is, is that. Um, so um, Senator, State Senator, President Barack Obama all came out to California uh, to raise money and she was there to help him. Um, and then he helped her, like I said, she, she, uh, when, when she was, I mean, she barely won in 2010, the uh, race for attorney general. Um, and, and he no doubt helped her, uh, helped her raise money for her, um, uh, and, uh, and held a rally for her. So, so it was a mutually beneficial relationship. Now, um, I didn't put this in the book, but I, I know that they talked uh, before she decided to run. I think he talked probably to every uh, major candidate uh, running for, for president. Um, whether, whether their relationship had uh, any impact on, on Joe Biden's decision to select her, I, I, I don't know. I don't have insight into that. Um, uh, I would be surprised if, if President Biden or the nominee Biden didn't talk to President Obama about her. Um, that would be surprising to me, uh, but I don't, you know, I don't know. Sure. 
to, 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 but from covering these people, you have that sense that that that's likely to have happened, even if we don't, even if we can't say for sure. <laughs> can't can't imagine that it didn't happen. Cannot imagine. Yeah. And um, uh, you know, she bristles though. You know, the 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 sort of facile view that 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 she's a female Obama. I mean, you know, she bristles at that and. And, and you can understand why. I mean, this is a woman who, who has accomplished a, a great deal on her own. She's not, um, uh, you know, to, she was the first woman, the first woman of color to be um, San Francisco district attorney, the first woman, the first woman of color to be California attorney general, um, and the second uh, black woman to, to be elected to the US Senate. I mean, she has, as she has said, Create, she's creating her own legacy. She is, um, uh, you know, I mean, there are of course similarities, but it 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 really is facile. She's, um, you know, they're very different lawyers. I mean, she was a, a courtroom prosecutor. He, you know, he 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 worked for um, a, a boutique law firm in in Chicago. Um, Definitely different. Yeah. And was uh, uh, and 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 taught at the University of Chicago. So, um, you know, she, he went. You know, he's a he's a Harvard guy. She went to uh, University of California Hastings, which is a, a terrific law school. Uh, but uh, you know, it's 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 not one of the top ten. Um, but it you know produces a lot of uh, great lawyers, my daughter included. Excellent. Um, I also want to ask you a little bit about Vice President Harris's sister, Maya. I know that the two of them have an extremely close relationship. Uh, Maya ran the ACLU in Northern California. I'm wondering how much influence does Maya have over Harris's thinking? What, what role do you expect her now to play that Harris has ascended to vice president? Mm -hmm. Well, so I, I don't think I've ever met Maya. You know, I suppose it's possible that we talked briefly on the phone once, but I, I don't remember uh, ever talking with her. I know lots of people in California who do know her. She was very much involved in the, um, in the Proposition 8 campaign here in 2008. And you, you, your listeners, viewers, members will know that, that Prop 8 was the a really nationalized uh, fight over uh, same-sex marriage. Um, uh, opponents of same-sex marriage put Prop 8 on the ballot uh, to uh, ban same-sex marriage. It didn't ultimately lead to the decision and Obert fell to, uh, 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 to declare con the constitutionality of same-sex marriage, but, but it was really important in that whole fight. Maya Harris was uh, the head of the ACLU of Northern California at the time, uh, and 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 it, uh, the Northern California ACLU um, uh, was really one of the leaders in opposition to Proposition H. She, the the organization raised more than two million dollars to uh, fight that initiative. Um, uh, so. You know what I know about Maya Harris and Kamala Harris is is that they are incredibly close. They are both their mother's daughters. Their their mother uh, died in 2009. They uh, they talk about her a lot. Uh, Kamala Harris always remembers her mom in uh, public settings. Um, the the the, um, uh, the relationship between Maya and Kamala Harris is incredibly tight. Political aides know that it's never a wise thing to get between the two of them. Uh, the perception was that during the presidential campaign, uh, Maya and Kamala Harris, uh, uh, that that really was Maya Harris who had who who uh, was the last call that Kamala would make. I'm sure. Doug Emhoff was the last last call, but uh, but you know her husband. But I'm sure that. Uh, uh, I mean, there's no doubt but that Maya and Kamala Harris are incredibly close, uh, trust one another, um, compete with one another, sometimes like sisters compete, um, and, uh, but that they're very good friends and very close. 
<laughs> Since you brought him up, I'll also take a minute and ask about Doug Emhoff, uh, obviously Harris's husband, now the second gentleman. Um, I'm wondering what role you see him playing. Obviously, you know, Maya and, and Kamala, they grew up together, they were sisters. But I think uh, if, I'm, if I remember correctly from your book, Doug and Kamala didn't meet till 2013, 2014. So even though they are, they are married, um, you know, you know, for raising two two kids, that's it, he's more a recent addition to her life. So, what sort of role do you think he'll play as second gentleman, and just sort of as someone who Harris talks to about policy making things and looks to for advice? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I have met Doug M. Hoff a couple of times. He, he seems like a great guy. Um, uh, I know people in Los Angeles who know him. Um, you know, he he was a. a a uh, Century City attorney, uh, obviously very good. He was managing partner of the LA offices of, of two major law firms, uh, entertainment lawyer. Um, uh, the, you know, people who know LA know that Century City is, is full of, <laughs> of a lot of really good lawyers and he was one of them. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, divorced father of two, golfer, Lakers fan, uh, all that stuff and and was uh, working away in Century City. Uh, uh, two clients came in. Uh, uh, one was uh, Rex Hudland uh, and his wife. Um, and at the end of their, uh, with the, some sort of legal issue, I don't know what it was, at the end of the conversation, as, as Doug uh, later told it, um, uh, she asked uh, whether he was single and he wanted to know why she wanted to know that. And she explained that she well had this friend um, who, who was single too, and maybe they'd like one another. And, and he asked who it was and, and she said, well, it's Kamala Harris. And, and this is so LA, um, this is a lawyer, big time lawyer. Who's Kamala Harris, jog my memory. People don't, people in LA pay not very much attention to politics. She jogged his memory and he said, oh, that Kamala Harris. So anyway, so they got together. I think that he is, um, uh, you know, from everything I know and, and, uh, and see uh, uh, and from, from afar, from 3,000 miles away from your town, I think he's loving being second gentleman. <laughs> you know, I think it was smart of him to, uh, to resign his partnership at DLA Parker, Piper. Um, uh, it's a, you know, it's a great law firm. It's got a big lobby practice in DC. I don't know how he would have navigated that. The conflict mm -hmm. of interest would, would just have been huge or the potential for that. So he's going to teach. I think students of his will be lucky to have him. Absolutely. Um, and I'll, yeah, definitely be interested to see sort of how he navigates things kind of precedent setting there as, as the first second gentleman, if he kind of takes on some of those traditional second lady roles that that we've seen. Um, obviously, someone with a lot of experience, uh, a lot of leadership, I think, as you point out in your book, that, you know, it kind of makes sense. These two people who are who have excelled in these high powered worlds, separate though they may be. Um, right. Another question from one of our viewers. Oh, sorry, well, did I, you have something you want to add? <laughs> well, it's just such an interesting um, you know, sort of American story. I mean, you know, he's, he's, um, he's, 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 he and uh, Vice President Harris obviously have a good relationship with his first wife. Um, uh, yeah, she was at the inauguration. She was uh, tweeting about it and right, right. very happy to be there. And, uh, and her, uh, and his grown children are now, you know, part of this extended family. I mean, it's, it's quite a, quite an American story, I suppose. Uh, um, well, it's just, it's, just it's, it, it's quite a blended family. I think it's, I think it's so interesting. Yeah, it's definitely, I, I think it, it reflects a lot of American families out there in a way that, that the vice president and, and sometimes the president don't, don't usually reflect. We had another question from our viewers, um, and I, I, I'm worried that I'm going to ask you and you're going to say this is more D.C. based than California based, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway. What's your assessment? I know that we are only in like, what, day five of the Biden administration. What's your assessment of how Harris has done so far as vice president? Is it sort of like what you have expected? Have there been any surprises? Mm -hmm. Um. Well, no, there have, I mean, I haven't been uh, surprised. Um, you know, it's, you're right, it is day five, day six, day five, I guess. 
Um, uh, she's, first week. Uh, yeah, her first week. Uh, you know, she doesn't make mistakes. I mean, there, there are in in her um, public life, there have been very few unforced errors. There have been a few, but but very few. And and so yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me that she is um, that she's uh, uh, doing uh, doing well so far. And you know, by well, um, you know, it's really Joe Biden's show. It's not the Kamala Harris show. Um, uh, you know, it wasn't. I mean, she did not give the inaugural address. He did. Um, uh, you know, I was it was struck. I was struck by Sonia Sotomayor. Uh, giving her the oath and and um, you know I mean we are you know we're witnessing a, a, a change in uh, the face of America and you know great it's it's uh, you know it's a it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's 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 a very interesting time of transition and and I and I really do view uh, Kamala Harris as a transitional person I mean California she was. Uh, a bridge, a trans uh, transition uh, in in so many ways, and in the ways of politics, um, uh, and and uh, who she is, what she is. Um, so it, she is a transitional uh, figure, and was in California, and now I think nationally. And, and I know you mentioned that you know she is sort of now in this position where should Biden decide to not run uh, in 2014, that she would be a contender. She'll be a contender in 2018 um, and further on. Does she need to do anything as vice president to sort of distinguish herself from Biden? I know usually vice presidents sort of say in the president's shadow, but I'm wondering if if she really wants to sort of be the bridge bring in this new era, is there something she's going to have to do or what could, what is something that she might be able to do given her background as far as, as showing leadership in this sort of second in command position? Yeah, well, I just, you know, I think that she, um, she doesn't have to state anything. It's, you know, I never, um, when she would come to the Sacramento Bee editorial board or, or when I would interview her for some column I was doing, you know, it does, she, you know, she does. She, she doesn't lead with, well. You know, I'm the first black woman, the first woman of Indian heritage. No, it's just, it's 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 who she is. She's talking about issues. She's talking about policy. Um, you know, who she is, what she is, speaks for itself. She didn't have to say anything. Um, and um, uh, you know, I I do think that 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 just given who she is. That that she will stand out. I mean, she's she's, um, but she also understands that Joe Biden is president, and she's not. I, the impression I get is that Joe Biden's pretty generous in 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 giving her the stage too. So uh, the the impression I get is that, is that he um, uh, is not going to ask that she stay in the corner. I, I think that that would be kind of silly. She's, you know, she's she's pretty good at what she does. Yeah, I liked what you said earlier about, you know, that she's not going to be sort of a, a potted plant in the corner. Do you think there might be any particular areas, just given what Harris's expertise are versus areas of Biden expertise, that Biden might call upon Harris to to sort of take the reins for something, kind of in the way that Obama asked Biden to take the reins on the cancer moonshot initiative? Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, again, you, your um, members will know more about DC than I, I know. But I know that when she went back to Washington as US Senator, uh, immigration was really high on her list of things to do. I thought it notable that the first bill that the White House sent to Congress dealt with immigration. Um, I, this is a huge issue in California. Um, you know, and and for the nation, we have to fix our immigration system. I think, and and uh, uh, so I know that she has thoughts on that. Um, it, it was apparent from her election night uh, speech in 2016 that that immigration was going to be really important, um, and and in many many ways, and in, in uh, during her time in the U.S. Senate, she came back to that. 
that's that's one certainly. Um, you know, racial inequities in, in healthcare. Um, uh, they're so exacerbated by the pandemic. <laughs> you know, it's it's so apparent. And in California, um, there's a great story the other day in the LA Times about about this uh, reality. Um, you know, we're 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 dealing with it um, uh, every day out here in 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 California. The racial inequities in healthcare. Um, uh, I think that this is an issue that that matters to her. Um, uh, so immigration, COVID is obviously number one. Figuring out how to get the economy back started again is. Yeah, is, is, and, and I'm thinking too. You know, as you mentioned all of these, I mean, I know that there's been a lot that's made of, I know the Biden administration wants to work in a bipartisan manner. They don't want to, you know, have to call in Harris all the time to be breaking 50-50 votes. And I know a lot of people have pointed to Biden's 36-year um, tenure in the Senate as sort of a, well, look, he has these relationships, he can work with Republicans. I'm wondering if you also see a little bit of that with with Harris, is she also going to be someone who's going to be able to go into the Senate Republican conference and say, hey, uh, we want to find a way to get to get you, Repu this group of Republican senators to yes. Do you see that as, as a role that she might have? Does she have sort of the bipartisan relationships to make that work? Well, I don't, um, I don't know well the politics on, on the Hill, you know it better than I do. Um, in the course of doing uh, putting together this book, I was able to uh, impose on a, a good friend and a great reporter, Josh Meyer, formerly of the LA Times, to to uh, help understand um, uh, her uh, her uh, work as a U.S. senator, um, and he did some great reporting for this book. Um, uh, it, it is apparent uh, that that she rubbed people wrong on on the Hill; that she was. Uh, she could be brusque. Uh, she didn't follow certain protocols. Uh, uh, you know, she, she did um, uh, reach out to John McCain. She reached out to uh, others, uh, but uh, but you know, she she uh, she she can be um, she can be a little flinty, um, and and I think folks uh, folks uh, on the Hill maybe uh, saw some of that. Um, that said, she she's she can be incredibly charming. So, uh, uh, and and she's a and she's an agile thinker. She she, um, you know, if there are if there are ways to um, uh, find common ground, I, I think she can be helpful. Um, but but again, I know based on 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 what I gathered, what Josh Meyer gathered, that that this is uh, uh, that this is a uh, uh, you know, she she didn't make huge numbers of friends uh, uh, among Republicans. Ron Wyden was somebody who's, who who quite admires her. There are others in the U.S. Senate who who clearly admire her. Um, so, got it, got it. So, sort of maybe uh, might be Biden who's taking more of a lead than than Harris. Um, I also want to talk because you mentioned you have these um, parts of your book that kind of talk about these little moments that Harris creates that are unscripted, that are off camera, that that really, you know, kind of are, are being sort of first reported for the first time in your book. And I wanted to see if you could talk for a little bit about just some of the examples of things that Harris did that didn't get a lot of publicity, but were nevertheless, you know, significant for either understanding her or significant just in her career. Mm -hmm. Well, you're, you're right. So I, I think you're you're asking about, about the instances where um, sort of unsolicited, she would reach out to people um, uh, who were uh, feeling some sort of pain. Um, uh, I ran. A, this was something that I was totally unaware of when uh, when I was writing about her as um, uh, as California Attorney General and, and as U.S. Senator. Um, but it's 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 a trait that I think she shares with with Joe Biden. This this empathetic. Uh, part of her. Um, when she was a San Francisco district attorney, um, one of her law school classmates um, uh, was a neighbor of, of a woman in San Francisco who had volunteered for Kamala Harris and was a big supporter of Kamala Harris, not a, 
not a big time politician, just, you know, just kind of a volunteer as, as there are in San Francisco and most other cities. And, um, uh, and this woman was near death. She was at a nursing home in San Francisco. Uh, and, uh, and he decided to give District Attorney Harris a call to see if maybe she might have a minute to write a note to this woman. And, and, and Harris had a different view. She decided, well, why don't we just go over there? And so they got in their separate cars and they met at this nursing home in San Francisco. And, uh, uh, and the uh, attorney friend walked District Attorney Harris to the woman's room and she sat in there hold, holding the woman's hand for 20 minutes. And, and uh, the lawyer, this guy, Matthew Davis, who told the story, um, uh, it wasn't in the room, but he knows that she was there for 20 minutes and then they left and the woman died a few days later. Now, you know, obviously this is not a woman who could ever have helped Kamala Harris in any way, shape or form, uh, but it was, a, it was a human moment. Uh, it only came out uh, during the campaign when, when President Trump was uh, uh, describing Kamala Harris as being a mean, nasty person, whatever it was he was saying. Um, and uh, and uh, Mr. Davis uh, uh, told this story um, to point out that that uh, uh, that Kamala Harris had this, uh, you know, that she could be quite empathetic. Something I think she really does share with President Biden. And there were there are other instances like that, sort of throughout. I mean, she there's a. Uh, a woman whose daughter died uh, unexpectedly of a seizure, and she she makes a point of calling this woman on Mother's Day, you know, anniversary dates. It happened with her um, uh, first press secretary in, in the Senate, Tyrone Gale, who many of your people will know. Um, you know, she, she called uh, Tyrone's widow uh, on the anniversary of his death, uh, uh, in the middle of the camp, at the end of the campaign, really, the presidential campaign, vice presidential campaign. She didn't have a lot of time to spare, but she figured out a, uh, a few moments to give Beth a call. Um, and I think uh, it, it mattered, you know, anniversary dates uh, uh, can be quite painful as anybody who has lost somebody knows. It's interesting, yeah, because you do paint this portrait of someone who has thick skin and can be a little flinty at times and can be very cautious, but then has like these these unscripted moments of of empathy and caring, particularly for those in her circle. We only have about three minutes left, and so I want to take the conversation on a completely different track because we are the National Press Club, and we do have a lot of people who are reporters um, and also are working on books. And I wanted to see one of our viewers asked if you could talk a little bit about your process writing this these, this book. I actually didn't realize until we were talking right now that you only wrote it in two months. Obviously, you had 26 years of, of knowledge on Harris to pour into it, but can you just talk a little bit about your process to research, to write, and to turn it around in the time period that you did? Yeah, <laughs> well, it was a lot of 12-hour days and seven days a week, and um, uh, my dog didn't get her walks and, and, uh, and, and like that, so no, it was, it was a very intense period of time. Um, you know, I was able to, to uh, impose on, on friends and others to uh, help. Josh Meyer was one, another uh, great reporter, Andy Ferrillo, who I've known since our days at the LA Herald Examiner, uh, helped with some reporting, um, uh, hired a great uh, fact checker uh, uh, and a researcher and a terrific college student, uh, Sasha Hupka, uh, who goes to UC uh, Berkeley. Uh, I think she has an internship at the LA Times Washington Bureau this this uh, year. Anyway, so I was able to hire some people to to help with the research. Um, uh, you know, I knew that the outline of the story uh, up to Washington, right? And that that was the goal was to was to sort of walk readers up from. Uh, from where she came in California uh, to to where she is now, and and it it will be up to, you know, uh, I mean now she's now she is of history, and and uh, great biographers will will look uh, more deeply at her, um, uh, and more completely at her. Um, uh, great uh, editor at Simon and Schuster, Priscilla Payton. Um, 
uh, so it, it, it uh, you know, it, it came together uh, uh, quickly. It was not something I was out seeking. Um, uh, so it fell into my uh, lap fortuitously. And, and I was just so honored to be able to, to uh, uh, help tell this story. Um, it's not complete. Um, we will uh, learn so much more about her. And there's, there, there, there are more things that I want to know about her time in California. Um, uh, it, it is a fascinating story. It's a fascinating California story. It, we, um, uh, it says in American life, but, but really it says a lot about California politics and the transition that we've gone through during her lifetime. But well, Dan, I, I have a ton more questions. I think your biography was beautifully written, but I do see that we are at the uh, hour mark. And so I, I know you've got a lot to do. I want to thank you so much for your time today. Thank you to everyone who, who took the time to view today, to tune in, to send questions. It is greatly appreciated. And uh, Dan, I, I hope when things go back to normal, one day we can host you in person at the National Press Club, as well as everyone who's viewing it on this live stream. Well, it's been a true honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. And once again, the book is Kamala's Way, An American Life slash A Californian Life. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. So I, if you haven't gotten your hands on it yet, highly, highly recommend. Thank you again so much, Dan. Appreciate it. Thank you.